What shall I compare the kingdom of God to? We've got mustard, we've got bread, so we need a hot dog. Somehow, the kingdom of God is like a hot dog that Jim will be cooking. Um, hold on to those scriptures about the bent over woman and the fig farmer and the little mustard seed. Um, but first, before we get to how those scriptures affect us right away, I want to look at this, uh, this little marker. <clears throat> Probably no one has done this move for a long time, and you have to get really close to read it. But this little plaque right here says, Memorial to Agnes Given Crosby Allen, July 2nd, 1916. A hundred years ago, something about this pulpit, a hundred years ago. Who was Agnes? Uh, no one knows in this church, even the people who've been here the longest, no one knows where this came from, when it came here. Who was Agnes? Who was she uh, on which so many Bibles have lain here, on, on what so many sermons have been preached here? Who was this woman that when we decorate for Christmas, Katie puts ribbons and covers her name? Who was this woman a uh, hundred years ago and what could she tell us about our next hundred years here? What would she think about God's message of the little things in life, working slowly until something grows, until someone is healed, until the good news blooms and rises? Well, I looked at the internet to find out who she was, and the internet is awesome sometimes. Once in a while, we can really discover things. Apparently, Agnes, because she has such a weird name, uh, she was born in 1891. Her mother was Agnes Gibbon Crosby, and her picture will be on the online version of this sermon. We have a picture of her. Uh, her father was the Reverend Arthur Huntington Allen. We have a picture of his gravestone, and if you squint at the bottom of the gravestone, it's so old that it's kind of worn out there, but it says, His servants shall serve him, and they will see his face. <coughs> Agnes's mother died, also named Agnes, um, died in childbirth, and her di dad died four years later. We don't know who raised her after that, but while her parents were alive, Arthur had been the pastor of Woodside Presbyterian Church in Troy, New York. Uh, I don't know if they had children's sermons there, but can you imagine her being passed around this motherless child lap to lap while Arthur preached? Can you imagine her first memories of church before she could put any of it into words? Her first sense of what must have been the only comfort and community she had? Her family had plenty of money, but money doesn't buy that acceptance and that belonging. So I can imagine in those very late 1800s, the Woodside Presbyterians loving little Agnes in a way that she needed. That church, by the way, Woodside Presbyterian, uh, it actually closed in 2003. It lasted all the way until 2003, and the 17 remaining members of the church voted 15 to 2 to close the church. And this is what the session wrote when the decision was made. They said, quote, when God creates anything, he has a purpose for it, and in God's sight, this church has completed its work which is sweet. Currently, the building is an unbelievably beautiful contemporary arts center. Uh, but what about that sentence? When God creates anything, God has a purpose for that. Agree? Amen? Amen. But just as true for our church on our 104th birthday, if you didn't know this is our 104th birthday here, our work here is not completed. Our work is vital to this community. Our work in giving people here and outside these walls is to offer grace and compassion and justice. And we will continue to build a sense of comfort and community into the hearts and minds of anyone who wants to take part. We will continue to serve God here. We will continue to strive to see God's face. Amen? Amen. This is going to be a call and response kind of sermon. I'm just feeling 1891 these days. So Agnes the Younger ended up going to school, boarding school in Connecticut. And eventually, on 29 January 1916, just four months after this plaque, she married James, she was 24, she married James Rowland Nash, who was 47, which is a little bit awkward, but we're not going to judge. They got married at Grace Church in Manhattan. It's a beautiful, classic, Episcopal, tall parish. And we don't have any proof, but my guess is, is that this pulpit somehow is connected as a, a gift, maybe, for that wedding because they could have a wedding in that church. Maybe someone made the pulpit and gifted it to that church. It's just a guess because in all the research I did, July 2nd doesn't have anything to do with this family. So maybe somehow it was part of the wedding ceremony and eventually it made it all the way out west to Netherland, Colorado from Manhattan, two places that are as different as they can get. 
Now, we do know that July 2nd was a Sunday in 1916, but we don't know what the date meant. We can assume that this first was used in a church, but we don't know which church. We can assume that somebody gave a hopeful message, but we don't know who it was or what they said. There's so many snippets in history where we know a little bit, but we want to know more. Agreed, Michael? There are so many things in our religious life where we have a hint about God, but we want to know more. We, we want to understand more. We want to fill in the blanks. And so we hold on to this mysterious pulpit, and we hold on to a mysterious God alive in our lives. Now, Agnes had five children. She passed away in 1979. I don't know anything else about her or her pulpit, but I know a lot about her kids. And do kids ever tell us anything about the mothers? Yeah. Sometimes it's, I hope not. Uh, sometimes, yes. So, you want to hear about Agnes's kids? Yes. All right. James Mallory Nash graduated from the University of North Carolina in 1940. He worked as a farmer until the war, the war, whereat he joined the Marines. After the war, he came back to farming. But something happened, and in 1970, he started traveling to India and started some kind of a family spiritual retreat in India. And I don't understand all of how that worked, but it's fascinating because how many farmer Marines go to India to meditate these days? <laughs> and maybe we need to be that open to God working in surprising and unexpected ways in our lives and twists and turns. Maybe God is doing something surprising behind the scenes here that only if we keep our minds open, only if we keep our hearts open, only if we keep our doors open, can we see God's blessing. Amen? Amen. Now, you have to know about Agnes' um, son, James. James had three children, one of whom is Philippa, who goes by Pha, uh, Creighton. She, Philippa's really a hard name to say, so she just goes by Pha. Um, anyone have a guess where Pha lives? Boulder. Nailed it. Do you know her? No. Okay. <laughs> but why would I ask if it wasn't Boulder? Yeah. Um, Pha lives in Boulder, the granddaughter of this Agnes right here. And on Thursday, I called her, and we had one of those weird conversations that no one ever expects to have in their life. Pha doesn't know anything about the pulpit. She didn't know it was just up the road. Uh, she doesn't have any clue what the date means. She assumes, like many of you do, that maybe it has to do something with her grandfather's Presbyterian roots. He had been dead for 22 years in 1916, but maybe someone gave it for, for his memorial to his wife rather than for his daughter. We, we don't know. But it's worth mentioning that Pha has been going through just a lot of heavy stuff in her life. A lot of us uh, have. She and I talked about painful relationships that are, that are cracking and need healing. She and I talked about uh, health issues, uh, a shoulder surgery, actually, and we could share those stories. And after I caught her completely out of the blue, she called back and she said, this is a miracle. She'd been reading the course on miracles. And she said, this is a miracle, this whole thing. Because she doesn't use that phone. She doesn't go in the office where the phone is. She wasn't supposed to be home at the time. She was running between things. She always screens her calls. And why would she pick up a random call? But she answered then. And this story that has been a hidden part of our life of worship for so long, we don't know how long, for her it wasn't hidden. It's a revelation. Right when she came to a place where she needed the most support, she discovered that her family's pulpit is just up the road. And that meant something for her about the way that God reaches down and says, as Dennis said, woman, you are set free. That meant something to her about how our cloud of witnesses stays connected in our lives. Maybe we can learn from Agnes's granddaughter. And when we least expect it, when we most need it, God is there to heal us. Amen? Yeah. Agnes's second child is Elizabeth Seymour Nash. All I know about her is that she went to Vassar, but her older sister, Henrietta Rutgers Crosby Nash, was amazing. I mean, this woman, Henrietta grew up with the family in France and Washington, D.C. She followed the older sister to Vassar to get a degree in bacteriology. How many women in 1941 have a degree in bacteriology? That's amazing. But she topped it, and she went to Yale next, and she got a master's degree in public health. Amazing. After that, she kept going up the ladder, and she married a man from Harvard. And he became an investment banker in French Morocco. You can't make this stuff up. It is so bizarre. After, uh, after that, she served as a nurse's aide in the war. And after the war, she came back to Massachusetts to raise her own four children. 
In the 1950s, in the 1950s, she volunteered to tutor African American children. And later, she served as an activist and a policy advisor for groups that were working on nuclear disarmament and women's rights. And through all of those years, she sang week after week in the choir at the first parish church in Weston, Massachusetts. Can you imagine what songs she sang in that choir? Maybe some of the songs that her own mother had remembered as a little child and hummed to her. Maybe she pushed the choir director to sing new songs about justice and peace and freedom, songs that lift up women and maybe old classics that respected her friends that she tutored. I'm so impressed by Henrietta. If you want to be more like Henrietta, say amen. Her son, by the way, Thomas, um, graduated magna cum laude at Harvard and married a woman who went on to get a graduate degree at Oxford. I just love this family. They just every step of them. So Agnes' fourth child was George Richard Nash. He went to Princeton, took a break to serve in the war under General Patton, which is amazing. And then he came back to school after the war, uh, and he had played golf for Princeton. He was the captain of the golf team. The story on the, online that I found about him is that they were in a match against Navy, against the Naval Academy, Princeton Navy golf match, and uh, they were down. Princeton was down on the 18th hole after four, three rounds. They were down by a, a stroke. And uh, George hit a hole in one to win the trophy. Uh, he went on to work uh, in the securities markets until the 80s. And eventually, somewhere through that, he developed his own interest in spirituality and traveled the rest of his life between India and Puerto Rico. Agnes's fifth and final child was Philip Vanderbogart Nash. They, they have great middle names. Uh, might have been Philip's namesake. I don't know. But he also went to Princeton, also served in the war. He was a radio tower manager in the Philippines. And after graduation, he went to Haiti to work on underwater photography. Uh, somehow his pictures got in the hands of Walt Disney and Stanley Kubrick, uh, who both loved him. And how can those two guys ever agree on anything? That's the most diverse artist you could have. So Philip uh, worked on Wall Street until his death, which happened last year on August 20th, one day between our anniversary and today. Creativity, justice, spirituality, those are the values that seem to have come from Agnes onto her children. And aren't those the same things that we appreciate so much here in Netherland? Wouldn't Agnes fit so well here? There's musicians, there's artists, there's activists. There are people who are so interested in connecting their soul to the, the source of all reality. People so interested in getting their hearts aligned to how we should act in the world. And not everyone would call those things God. But maybe that's the point of the scripture, is that not everyone would call that God. Maybe the point is, is that so many people around town, they're just not quite sure whether to trust this church or any church, what we've been up to for three years, 103 years. And eventually, some walk in and say, eh, I might take another look at faith. If we're going to have music like that, if, if, we can, if we can celebrate justice like that, eventually they might come in. And if we keep trying to live like God's kingdom... Eventually more people will come, welcomed, nurtured, ready to grow with this family, ready for things to take off, ready for our lives to be transformed. And if that happens, what is happening now? I just have to say, whatever you think about God, God is here. Or maybe some of you wonder about this church, about all kinds of church, what are we really accomplishing? I mean, we meet every Sunday. We put so much time and energy and spirit and money into all these projects at church. What's really changing? We're always so busy, but what difference do we make? Just spinning our spiritual wheels. And God reminds us that yeast doesn't work so well until it gets spun and kneaded and pushed into the dough, until it has time to rise. And with the work, with the patience, things can change dramatically. People can be fulfilled in new ways. And don't you see it when children are excited, when neighbors build their lives together, when music takes us places, when the word of God challenges us to be the best people we can be? Or maybe you lament, churches are just places for bent over old people to sing songs and talk about the good old days and make themselves feel better to give a few dollars somewhere. I know churches like that. I've been to churches like that. But here... At this church, I see young and old. I see bent and strong. I see worn out and energetic. I see people who want healing, some who find it. I see people who offer healing, and I hope that they know that their work and prayers helps others stand up. You don't have to call that God working through us if you don't want, but that's what I see. 
a place that is growing together, growing out, ready to offer comfort and guidance to anyone in need, whether they're four years old and orphaned, or 40 years old and lost, or 84 and full of wisdom to share. See, see back in the scripture, in this, in this portion of Luke that Dennis read from, Jesus was preaching to people uh, who weren't all committed followers. He was preaching to people who were disheartened. They wanted their lives fixed, and they couldn't tell that it was happening. These were broken people who needed healing. They, they looked at the unjust systems around them, and it was so frustrating. They worked so hard. They cared for something. They tried to trust that the, this was the right thing to do. This was the right way to do it. God, it's so frustrating when the tree doesn't blossom and produce the fruit you know is there. Sometimes even the best things in life can be so discouraging because you put in so much, and it takes so much work to keep moving forward. But God never made a world. God never made a world in which our strength and our cleverness determines our destiny. That was never the pattern God expected. As much as we tend to feel that, the need to work harder and harder, the good news doesn't work that way. It's maybe the hardest uh, part of faith to keep our eyes and ears open for where God might sneak in when you least expect it and bless all the work that you've put in. It might be the hardest part of faith when God pushes you to keep at it, persevering, giving more even when you've given so much. It might be the hardest part of faith to see the possibilities of the future when you sit in such an unsure present. And yet that is precisely what we are called to do by the parable of the fig tree. We are called to envision, to hope, to inspire each other. We are called to teach our children even when they're bored. We're called to reach out to help neighbors even when they won't help themselves. We're called to lift up the beauty and wonder of life even in the midst of a storm. We are called to give hope to the hopeless. We are called to take the smallest, the most mundane talents and time and treasure that we have and give them to God to make something strong and lasting and so worthwhile. Maybe some other time we're called to feel spiritual or to understand more. Maybe at some other time God says that we're called to sin less or love more. But here in this place, for this church, for the body of Christ, to care for people here and outside these walls, we are called to serve and do. So, Hanson, are you saying that if we don't serve in some way, we're not connected to God? I'm not saying that. Jesus said that, and if that makes you mad, email him. He's got an easy email. I have enough emails. So, Hanson, are you just setting us up to ask us to sign up for one more thing, to do one more thing, to give one more thing, to make this place healthy so the produce can come forth and, and bloom? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of what I'm doing. Now, listen, if, if you are um, a visitor here, let this place be a, a welcoming, opening uh, process for you to... Find a place where you can figure out what you believe and, and who you like to hang out with. Um, there's a lot of great folks here who can, who can kind of inspire your lives. Uh, but if this is the place that you choose, call your family, uh, then yeah, you're called to serve, to make this place blossom. And we don't serve because that, that will connect us to God. We serve because we are connected to God, or we want to be, or we want others to feel God's love. And if we don't serve the world, if we don't serve our neighbors, if this church doesn't do all those things that it takes to produce fruit, we're not just going to linger and slow down. What the parable says is without love expressed in and through the church, we're going to be cut down. We'll be done. Paul says if we don't do that, we're just a clanging symbol. Without love expressed through the church, we are religious white noise. And it doesn't matter how great we sing doesn't matter what we donate. doesn't matter how wise and handsome the pastor is. <laughs> Sneak that in there. Without stretching to care for each other and our neighbors, there's just no reason to have more of these church anniversaries. And how do we give? How do we serve? To do that, we need you. We need all of you. If you're a visitor, we need you to be the visitor. If you're here all the time, we need you to sign up for child care. We need people to sign up to prepare coffee and snacks when there's not a potluck. We need people to, who will be willing to serve as ushers and liturgists and sing in the choir. We need people willing to take a leadership role on session or deacons or on some committee or team. We need people willing to make a meal when someone is sick. And yes, we need people who are willing to respond to God's grace in their life with a financial offering. Because you may have heard last week or last month that for all the amazing things going on in this church, so many things happening here, we are in a critical financial position. 
And it's really not that complicated. It's very simple. Little churches can't afford full-time pastors. It just doesn't happen anywhere. And you all have made a leap of faith because we have some reserves, because faithful people have given in the past, and we have nine or 15 months for those reserves. But after that, we either come up with solutions or I become a plaque, just like Agnes. See, for three years, we gardeners together have been fertilizing and watering and mulching and pruning and picking off the insects, and the tree looks great, except we're in a fig deficit. And who knows, maybe our little tree it just had bad soil for too long. Maybe there's crazy little pine beetles coming and chewing us up from the outside. Maybe there's people in the farm who are just picking off leaves for the heck of it. Maybe people in the world are just tired of figs. And so they turn to apples or oranges or hiking or sleeping in or something like that. Understood? And you know, this fig tree that we have here, it gives great shade. It is a great place for kids to climb. You could... You know what? It's so good for love. You could metaphorically etch your little initials in there, put a little heart around there, and this place would be able to nurture that. But figs are supposed to produce fruit. Yeah. And if a fig tree doesn't have figs, eventually it gets cut. So what does the caretaker say? Give it another year. Try a little harder. Talk to some fig experts. Learn from other fig trees. Ask the neighbors for better manure. Because here's the thing. I believe God is blessing this place. So I believe we can fix our budget issues. And I believe we can keep this church moving toward another century of good work. Whether you can or can't give money, I believe there are so many things that all of us can do. If everyone brings a friend to a church event like this, think of how full and fun it could be. Think of how many people could hear a good word from their, from their source of their life to the core of their being. If more people came to men's group or women's group, think of how those relationships could build and the Spirit of God could work through those friendships. If more people offered to water flowers, think of how many more people could walk through the garden and understand it to be a calm place in this town. And these things might seem small, but what does God say about mustard seeds? God can do great things with a small offering. And if God can do great things with your small offering... It is up to all of us to make those offerings of love and service so that this is, for this church, the year of the fig. Amen? Amen.